Good afternoon, class and professor. Um, today we are going to be talking about Einstein's theories of relativity and the importance of them in today's uh, scientific world. Uh, my name is Joseph Delatry. I go by Joey. Um, I know you guys have been reading my responses and all that throughout the class, so um, I guess putting a voice to the to the name is something a little bit different. But uh, yeah, here we go. So first, let's start with the importance of Einstein's theories. Um, it's the current template for our understanding of gravity. It's what we use in every application of it um, at this current time, um, other than in quantum physics, which we will kind of touch on later. Um, it is also the foundation of our black hole knowledge, which Einstein was originally against, um, but then was proven later in it. Well, proven is a hard word to say, but um, his theory of general relativity was was put to the test, and it was found that under his theory, uh, they were, in fact, possible. Um, and it is also used as the standard of the Big Bang framework. Um, we will also be talking about time dilation and things along that lines because uh, we have satellites and, and all that, and it's, it's just a, it's a very important thing um, within general relativity to know. So... First, let's take a look at our understanding of gravity. So we have to start out at Newton, and his theory was that gravity is just a universal force on all objects that exist. So he was very much ahead of his time when it came to um, the understanding of gravity uh, and, and the math that he used to explain it is the best way to put it or describe it. Um, it was not necessarily accurate, but for the time, it was well ahead. Um, and then Einstein, he developed a theory upon Newton, um, which was significantly more accurate, so much so that it's literally what we use today. So um, Einstein said that gravity is a natural outcome of a mass's existence in space. So everything has a gravitational pull. And the larger an object is, the more um, pull that that object has. So... Um, Earth and the moon, for instance, as described by this picture. Um, and then he had two theories, general, which is the relation of other forces of nature, gravity and acceleration, and then special, which is the relationship uh, to speed and time in the absence of gravity. Now, special is a little bit strange because we're talking about gravity and it's in the absence of it, but it is something that's very important to know. Um, so we'll talk about the elevator example, and this wasn't. This is obviously not an example that was initially used by Einstein, but it is one that's very easy to understand. Um, so let's imagine you're standing in an elevator, much like the uh, poorly drawn man um, is on the right, and there's a hole bored through one side or both sides is uh, another example that you see, but one suffices for this one. If you are the poorly drawn man in the elevator, and a person is shining a light through that hole, and you are not in motion, the light will appear as a straight ray, which was how we originally thought light was, that no matter what, light traveled in a singular distance and just unless refracted, um, it was always straight. Um, and then the next picture is constant velocity. So like if, I, if the elevator is going up at a constant acceleration, the light would seem askewed almost. It would be slightly angled downwards. And it's easily shown in the picture. And when you're reading it about the two holes, it, it would show that the light wouldn't reach the second hole on the other side of the elevator. It would be below it because of your, your acceleration or your constant velocity, I apologize. Now in the terms of acceleration, light would look bent. Um, because you were moving fast enough, the light would not even come close to the hole and it would end up going to the ground if you're going fast enough and you would be able to see a parabolic curve from where the light entered the elevator all the way down to the uh, point on the ground. And it's this is now how we perceive gravity, which is as a geometric phenomena um, rather than just a pull that everything um, everything has. So let's talk a little bit about black holes. Um, like I stated earlier, Einstein did not believe black holes could exist. Um, 
while he had all of these amazing theories on gravity and, and how light traveled and, and um, all that, he just could not believe that a singular point in our universe could be so dense and have so much gravitational pull that nothing could, could escape it, not even light. He just did not believe it. Um, and then Carl Schwarzschild, he was the first to propose the black hole theory, or a singularity as he puts it. Um, and like I said, a black hole is an area that is so dense in matter um, that the gravitational pull is so strong that light can't escape it. And then in a published work on continued gravitational attraction, which I believe was published in 1938, um, used Einstein's theory of um, relativity and and Again, I'm going to say proved, but it supported um, the fact that gravity could, in fact, be that strong that it could just not escape it and and hit the black hole and go where we don't know because we don't know what's on the other side if there is another side of the black hole. Um, and then I, I just want to mention this picture because I absolutely love it. Uh, it's a it's a, a picture of the the first picture we've ever taken of a black hole that was taken in 2019 and i think it's just amazing so um einstein's theory of general relati relativity was also used in um, the big bang theory um, it's the most subscribed theory um, of the start of our universe period um, there are others out there but this is the one that has the most co concrete evidence for it um and it's the the basis of it is that the universe started at a singular infinitely hot dense point that swelled and expanded over 13.8 billion years technically 13.77 but we're rounding up um and that's supported by redshift and background radiation um redshift was seen in telescopes very early when we started being able to see radiation in telescopes um, and scientists were very confused by it because it, it just always seemed to be there in every location, no matter where you looked. Um, and it, depending on where you're looking in the sky, it could be longer and shorter. Uh, the longer it is, the faster an object is moving and the shorter it is, the slower, um, in relation to the earth. Um, and the quote unquote explosion, it, it didn't necessarily explode, but I guess we don't really know. Um, it started at an unimaginable rate uh, so quickly that just things were so hot and just like being ripped apart and reformed and ripped apart again um, until it finally slowed down a little bit. The universe cooled down and things could actually start forming uh, stars, planets and all that um, to what we know today. So let's talk a little bit about time dilation. Uh, time dilation is really well explained uh, in Interstellar, which is uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, where I can't remember the character's name, but they're on a planet where every hour is seven years on Earth. Now, this is a crazy, crazy thing to wrap your head around. Um, and if you watch that movie and have no um, prior knowledge of Einstein's uh, theory of gra uh, r relativity, I apologize, um, it does not make sense and it still doesn't make a whole lot of sense and, it, and it, like my brain does not want to completely wrap around the fact that a person even on like the ISS experiences time at a slower rate uh, Scott Kelly when he was up in space for a year um, came back to earth five milliseconds younger than his twin like it's a uh, very marginal it's not seven years but because he's so close to earth the time dilation was less um but uh it's gravity and speeds effect on time there is also um there's also a time dilation within special relativity but i'm not going to go into that i'll just stay with uh just the th normal theory of relativity um our satellites have to take account for time dilation especially our positional satellites um if positional satellites didn't take into account time dilation, they would be up to 11 kilometers off every single day consistently. So after 10 days, they would could be up to 110 kilometers off, which would be absolutely catastrophic, especially for um, people that are constantly using it for navigation. And we can think cars, but let's think bigger, like planes. I don't think you want your location for a plane to be 11 kilometers off because if you're flying co-altitude with another aircraft, 
your now separation point laterally has to be 11 kilometers at minimum and you could still technically hit them which is crazy um and then to kind of explain time dilation a little bit we're going to look at the light clock now imagine a light clock as two mirrors and between those two mirrors is a singular ball of light and each time that ball of light hits the bottom mirror it reflects back to the top mirror and so on and so forth forever now stationary it looks like the first picture on the left where it's just bouncing up and down in a straight line and let's call that a second right every second that happens tick tock tick tock every every second that is how our clocks on earth at a constant gravity go it is what we have designed it is one second now if i am standing on a platform and a person holding this clock is on a train moving at an astronomical speed not faster than the speed of light because the speed of light is constant but very quickly to me the way that clock is now being perceived i am seeing it move and the light inside also move in whatever direction it is which is also increasing the distance that light has to go from one mirror to the other now this is pretty simply explained with the pythagorean theorem pythagorean theorem i apologize um a squared plus b squared equals c squared um so for however long it has to go in distance squared plus however um the however far the distance is between the two mirrors squared is equal to the distance that that light has traveled which is farther than the normal second so let's say they're i i don't know the exact numbers but let's say they're going half the speed of light all of a sudden their one second that they are perceiving is still one second to them but to us it is significantly longer let's say it's six or seven seconds and it's a crazy theory to talk about and um it gets more and more um extravagant when you're looking at higher speeds so there are quasars that were um that you can see that we have seen in um our telescopes uh that are traveling 90 percent of the speed of light the time dilation is ginormous on those quasars i don't have the exact number um on hand but it is it is astronomically different than than the simple thing well i say simple but the um the satellites in our gravitational pull of earth so now we're going to talk a little bit about quantum physics and this is where our understanding of gravity breaks at the seams so einstein's theory is just in general the most accepted because it has been the most accurate but when we are talking about something so small which uh, is dubbed the planck scale which you can see on the right here like the size of a person a blood cell atom atomic nucleus and then planck scale is way way down there it is the smallest measurable length before space time itself starts to break down it is it is the singularity point of a black hole and it Einstein didn't even believe that black holes could exist. So how could he have possibly thought that a point so small within a black hole could even exist? He, he couldn't have imagined it whatsoever. Um, but currently, scientists are constantly trying to wrap their brains around uh, this theory. Um, because right now, while our understanding of gravity is correct in the sense of everyday life, it cannot explain what happens at such a small scale um and i just think that is absolutely amazing i personally currently am not smart enough to um completely understand quantum physics and it blows my mind that that we as um, a human race have gotten to this point and i'm so excited to see where we go from here but this um concludes my my presentation so i thank you all for watching the video um i really enjoyed the class uh, over the last eight weeks and i will hopefully carry on my learning of philosophy more so into life um 
I don't believe I have to take philosophy classes after this, but I will definitely take the lessons I learned and continue inputting them into my daily life. So thank you guys again. I appreciate it. Um, and I hope you all have a, a good rest of your education and life.